Um, I have seen a 24-year-old woman. Uh, she's a professional international football player. And she comes to my clinic because she lost her periods. This is called amenorrhea. And then amenorrhea means that you haven't had your periods for six months or longer. And this is abnormal. Um, I want to know a lot of a lot of things when you come to me uh, when you have this amenorrhea. I want to know, for example, how were your previous periods? So before the six months, were they regular? Were they irregular already? Have you ever had normal periods? Um, an amenorrhea can also mean that you're pregnant because then you have an amenorrhea as well. So I want to to uh, check if you're not uh, pregnant. We see amenorrhea when you lose or gain weight very easily or fast. Um, so I'm, I'm checking your, your body mass index and uh, asking you about your weight loss or gain. And there are a few things which call, uh, could cause amenorrhea as well, which, is, um, uh, which will give some signs through the body, uh, which can give me information. So, uh, for example, uh, galacteria, which means that you have some fluid loss from your breasts, but also hirsutism, which means that you have a lot of black hairs um, all over your body, more male-like. Um, and, of course, again, it's very important to know if you use any contraceptive medication, especially uh, hormonal contraceptives, which could influence an amenorrhea, so not having this menstrual cycle, but it could also um, cover uh, problems. And uh, since we know that, uh, um, uh, let's say, if we sh we've checked all these things, um, we make an inside ultrasound to see if your uterus and ovar ovaria are normal of size. And if we have some signs uh, which could declare one of the points that I mentioned over here, um, and we do a laboratory blood tests, um, uh, which uh, can exclude some of the uh, reasons which I, I just mentioned. But in sports, uh, we very often see one or two main diagnoses when you have an amenorrhea. And um, uh, Kirsty is going to tell us a bit more about that. Thanks, Emma. Um, so I want to just quickly show you a visual representation of what amenorrhea looks like and what it is compared to uh, a normal healthy menstrual cycle. So if we just take a, a few moments on this slide, um, if please you take your eyes to the figure which says ovulatory. Um, this shows the menstrual cycle as it should be. So here you can see um, estrogen is in red and progesterone is in blue. Um, if we just concentrate on, on those two hormones specifically. And so they have this pattern and you can see little red arrows at the start of the cycle, which shows that this player is, is menstruating. And this cycle length can be somewhere between 21 and 35 days and is, is considered normal. And so if you then look at the end of the figure and it says amenorrhea, um, you can easily see, uh, firstly, there are no red arrows. So as Emma said, this player is, is not menstruating regularly um, and has had a, an absence of menstruation for many months. Um, and estrogen and progesterone are clearly, you can see from this visual, not presenting as they should be. Um, now, for a long time, we said that amenorrhea was uh, an early warning detection system in female athletes um, to say that something uh, could be wrong. Um, what I just want to show you here briefly is that actually there are other types of menstrual dysfunction which may happen along the way. So actually, for some for some players, we, we move from ovulatory to amenorrhea quite quickly and others take longer. And for some of those who take longer, we can see some various steps. They don't always occur discreetly like this and in this order. Sometimes some happen at the same time. But actually, what we might find is that if we look at ovulatory and compare it to the one, the picture next to it that says LPD, this stands for luteal phase deficiency. Um, here, the cycle length is, is still the same, somewhere between 21 and 35 days. This player is still menstruating regularly. But for those who are quick with their eyes, you can see the blue line for progesterone is, is not the same. And so this shows us maybe the importance of not just looking at the regularity of menstruation as the important thing within uh, elite sport. We should also look at maybe how progesterone is doing, because luteal phase deficiency can be somewhat hidden. So you wouldn't know necessarily that you had this slightly altered picture. 
If you look to the figure next to it, which says anovulatory, again, cycle length is, is fine. This player is still menstruating regularly, but here you can see that neither estrogen or progesterone are behaving as they should do. And again, this can be a hidden type of menstrual dysfunction. Because they're bleeding regularly, you could make the assumption that they've got that lovely ovulatory picture. If you look at the next one, so this is actually stepping up in the picture. So these are oligomenorrheic cycles. So this is the first time you get a slightly um, a more obvious hint that maybe there is dysfunction. So here the cycle length is longer than 35 days. Um, you can still see that there can be ovulation within these longer cycles. But actually, if you look at the anovulatory version of oligomenorrhea, not easy to say out loud, very difficult to write down and spell. But if you look at this picture at the very top of the screen to the right hand side, you can see that the picture there of the hormones is absolute chaos. So this player could be menstruating somewhat regularly, so maybe 36, 37, 38 days at a time, so not amenorrheic, but you can see that their hormonal profile is completely chaotic and not the same as the ovulatory picture. Of course, as the cycles get longer and longer and longer, then we inch towards amenorrhea, and that's the picture that you get. So I think it's really important that while we're super interested in amenorrhea, that maybe if we look to track the menstrual cycle to a deeper level, that we might actually see some of these dysfunctions before our player arrives at amenorrhea. So we might be able to prevent some amenorrhea in some cases. I just want to quickly show you, this is um, a data set from a recent systematic literature review. Um, it shows, um, if we just look at the primary amenorrhea and secondary amenorrhea, you can look at the number of studies uh, which looked at this. Um, I haven't got my glasses on, so I can't read those numbers. They're too small for me. Hopefully you can see them. Uh, but you can see the relatively small number of studies which are reporting primary and secondary amenorrhea within uh, female athletes. They then nicely split it up into adults and then adolescents because we sometimes associate, particularly, of course, primary amenorrhea, that's when you have that delayed first period. So when they're older than, say, 15 or 16 and they've not yet had their first period. So, of course, we might expect to see a little bit more primary amenorrhea in adolescent players and then we see more secondary amenorrhea in, in adult players. So just something to consider to see what is the prevalence within uh, female athletes. Again, please remember this is not specific to football, but it could well be that that is where a future study uh, may look at the incidence of both of these conditions. And then lastly, you might think that I've just put up the same slide again that I did when it came to heavy menstrual bleeding, but they're actually similar issues. We need more high quality research examining either the incidence and then the effects of amenorrhea on uh, performance, whether that's either training performance or competitive performance. But of course, we also must think of that duty of care rather than researching it. Do we need to actually work to prevent it and have useful interventions? Again, if we change the culture within uh, elite women's sport and within football, we should have an openness uh, about this topic. So again, if you have a player within your club, do they know who to present this, this issue to? If you have a medical doctor, of course, that might be the obvious choice. But sometimes these are conversations that an athlete might have while they're getting some treatment. And so they may speak to the physiotherapist about it. It could be something they speak to the strength and conditioning coach about as they're working out maybe in the gym. So again, thinking about a multidisciplinary approach to this and openness, um, you know, really open conversations within the club and then knowing uh, how to screen for this. So how often do we ask the players about their menstrual cycles? If we ask once a year, well, maybe they were ovulatory at the start of the year and seven, eight months in their amenorrheic. But if we don't ask them again, then till month 13, we're allowing them to be amenorrheic for a very long time. So thinking about when do we screen? What questions do we ask? So thinking about the questions that Emma showed you. And again, who do we signpost our players to? So if they're telling us that they've not menstruated for six months, who is it that you send them to? So again, having that pipeline of care and then thinking about possibly the long term health implications of amenorrhea. So we really do want to identify people before Ideally, they become amenorrheic, but if they are amenorrheic, how long has that been the case and what are we doing to return them to that ovulatory cycle? So that's from me. So back to Avert for some questions on this case study. Well, back to the three of us, I'd say. Um, so if anyone has a question, please, please put it in a chat um, relating to this. Um, I have a question that maybe relates to, um, to a question on red screening that was posted in the chat. 
you just alluded to it, Kirsty, as well, uh, prevention. Um, for prevention, you need to know something about risk factors. Um, it's, it's nice to see all these graphs with dysfunctions. Well, not nice, actually, but it illustrates the case well. Um, in, in, instead of monitoring and diagnosing early, what, what can we do to maybe prevent uh, athletes from getting into a dysfunctioned cycle? Oh, that's a, that's a big question. We, um, maybe a smaller question. Do we know about any risk factors? <laughs> Let's keep it um, at that. Okay, so I, I think the, the obvious risk factor that possibly a, a lot of people on the, the call are thinking about is around low energy availability. Um, so, of course, we know that if the body is faced with the challenge of, of low energy availability, so insufficient um, energy to do everything, uh, the body is clever, maybe makes a priority of, okay, we're going to fuel today's training um, session, of course, brain function, heart function, etc. And so it works its way around the body and says, okay, well, today I'm not pregnant. We don't need to have a baby today. And so it, it turns off or sacrifices the reproductive axis. Um, so, of course, the obvious risk factor is if, if that is the case, if low energy availability is an issue, um, that could be the result. So I think raising awareness around good fueling um, and not just, you know, eating enough, but eating enough uh, carbohydrate and so on. And so there's been some studies recently uh, published around possible fear of carbohydrate within elite women's football so that study specifically from from football um or soccer sorry depending on where you are in the world um but i think you know that that would be the, would be the obvious one and of course then as as emma said you know things like pregnancy you know it, it used to be um 20 years ago the first thing that would happen is a pregnancy test and now that's almost forgotten about and if I can, maybe one more thing um, as a risk factor that I would mention, just because we recently did a case study on this, um, is around stress. And uh, so we we worked with the player and um, who was amenorrheic, and we of course thought low energy availability did a, a big piece of work around fueling. Um, she may have been the best fed player in the WSL, um, but actually didn't return. Her periods did not return. And uh, cutting a long story short, actually um, her periods came back after she moved home to her own country, an international player, um, clearly a little bit homesick, a lot of stressful situation, being away from home and so on and so on. Of course, we can't say that that's the actual cause of this. But in terms of an observation, when some of those stressors were taken away, um, then for her, her periods came back. So I think um, for me, it would be low energy availability, um, stress and, and pregnancy would, would be the three that would come to my mind first. But there are many others. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All these are very good, Kirsty. You mentioned, I think, the most... Uh, uh, often seen in female athletes, but in the outpatient department, I also see, for example, polykystose ovarias, uh, which cause oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea. And this is a really different kind of cycling disturbance. Uh, so it's really, you need to have blood lab laboratory tests to find out which is the cycle disturbance and what's the cause uh, to uh, yeah, solve it and prevent for further harm. Yeah, obviously, there's also a, a difference in just general risk factors for, for dysfunction and sports-related risk factors in relation to dysfunction. That's uh, maybe something to highlight. Here's a question for you, maybe, um, Emma. Um, what can be done to return players to the ovulatory cycle? Is there any insight oh, you can share question. on that? <laughs> Thank you for the one. Well, um, uh, what can be done? Um, uh, it, it, you need to find out the cause <laughs> because if you're not having an ovul ovulatory cycle, um, I cannot resolve it or help if I don't know the cause. So um, that's the first thing I want to know. Uh, so I'm going to ask all the questions I just showed you. I'm going to make an inside ultrasound to see if your uterus and ovary has a normal size, normal follicular size, normal uh, amount of follicles. And if yes, uh, if everything is normal, then I would do a blood test. This will divide for me in if there is a relative energy deficiency syndrome or if you have, for example, polycystose ovarias. And both um, uh, conclusions or diagnosis will be treated differently. Uh, so um, return players back to the ovulatory cycle is really depending on the cause, I would say. Thank you. 
then there's one more question um, that we can post here. Whoever wants to answer this one um, gets to gets to answer this one. Um, is it okay if players ask, and this one is in two pieces, to sometimes give them medication to delay the menstrual cycle? Here it is. So this is the second part of the, the question. Shall I answer this question? <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I don't prescribe anything. I'm, I'm a <laughs> doctor, so you're the, you're the real doctor. <laughs> um, um, I do give medication to delay a menstrual cycle. For example, when they experience heavy menstrual bleeding or when they experience very uh, uh, heavy abdominal pain during their period, uh, which could cause their perform, which could influence their performance. Um, uh, and um, I would give, I, I would discuss with the with the female athlete what she wants. Everything I give has sometimes side effects. Uh, it depends if you want to give it only for this game, for this match, or you want to continue with having something. Uh, if you're having other problems, but um, Ciclo Capon, which is called, uh, which is mentioned over here, will not delay uh, the menstrual cycle or your period. It will only decrease the blood loss if you have men heavy menstrual bleeding because it influences your blood amount, but not it's not a hormone. So it will not give you an ovulatory cycle or it will not stop your uh, period. Mm 